Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on action. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco, and it's always great to be here with all of you. Um, I very much appreciate all our new listeners and viewers of the show. We're getting some great feedback. Um, Before I introduce my guest this week, I want to share, I'm very excited because at the end of the show, our Lifestyle Watch contributor, Sherry Morrison, is going to be profiling one of my very first guests on the show, um, somewhere between eight and 10 years ago, believe it or not. Her name is Marcy Shankweller, and she's the founder of an incredible organization called For Pete's Sake. Um, And it's a cancer organization that sends families who are going through uh, the challenge on vacations and trips. It's it's really going to be great. Um, As always, I want to say thank you to our sponsors and our watch team members who are um, a very important part of the show every week and talk about their industries um, in finance and in the military. We have a veterans segment. um, We have a sports segment. And we're bringing on some new Uh, corporate partners very soon. So I'm going to be making a big announcement. Um, Now, I'm very excited and honored to welcome to the show Emily Bibb. Emily is the co-founder of a company called Brief. Emily, welcome to the show. Hi, Sue. How's it going? It's going great. Um, We chatted just before the show and I was commenting on your beautiful background. And just so our viewers know, you're joining us from Colorado. I am. So it's it's we're having a heat wave like the rest of the country. <laughs> what, what part of Colorado? Um, I am in Aspen. You're in Aspen. Okay. Yeah. So I spend um, some time here and then some time back at our HQ in New York City. Okay. That, that's a lot of back and forth. How are you enjoying the travel right now? Has it been smooth with everything that's happening? No. Wild. No. <laughs> um, two weeks ago, I was stuck at JFK for... 18 hours almost. Oh no. Oh my gosh. It was was wild. Um, but my bags didn't get lost. So I, I am blessed about that, but yeah, it's been wild, but I think it's also nice to see everyone out and about and traveling again. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't complain. I have the best of both worlds. Yeah. Well, you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to start off the show talking about something that you shared that I think is so sweet and says a lot about who you are, um, that you consider yourself always an entrepreneur. And at the age of five, you had your first business. Yes, (laughs) That's incredible. Yeah. I think it's something that's been in my DNA. I, you know, and then kind of nurtured through my parents. Um, but when I was five, I started a potted plant business in my backyard. So I bought a bunch of terracotta pots. I decorated them with markers, popped in a flower, and then I would just go around the neighborhood and sell them. And um, then I had my cousins helping me out, my sister. And that was the start of my obsession with, I think, building and, and having this like entrepreneurial spirit and testing and learning and meeting new people along the way. Were, were you at five? Do you rem- I mean, five is a... Um... It's very young. Sometimes I feel as though we have very vivid memories, maybe after six or seven. Were you kind of um, a social little girl that, you know, just really had the confidence to go out and interact with people? It's funny because I don't think of my, I was pretty shy back in the day and I'm still more of an introvert. Um, But I think I just had ideas and my parents were like, let's, run with it. And so I remember my dad got little business cards printed at Staples, must have cost me 20 bucks, but I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And so I would just spend my days kind of building towards that. And that was the start of fruit stands, lemonade stands, tie-dyed t-shirt companies. Wow. I just was always making. Yeah. You were meant to do something on your own. What, tell me about mom and dad. What did they do? Were they entrepreneurs? Were you watching them run their own businesses? They were not. Um, but my dad was actually a marketer. So I think that's kind of 
how I got that into my DNA and ended up going into marketing and now what we're doing with brief. Um, so I think a lot of my discussions with my dad from early on, um, were about kind of how to position things, how to brand things, what the audience looks at. Um, so he did that in television. And then my mom was a creative. So she, um, is a jeweler and is always making. And I think oh, wow. those two of like positioning and making kind of made me who I am today. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's very impactful in your own life story is that you were a very um, successful um, competitive athlete. You were a swimmer. Yeah. And um, I have a quote here. You said, athletics taught me how to handle failure and yet at the same time, beautiful outcomes. Yeah. Tell me, tell me what that meant to you. Man, I, I can't think enough of my of like sports for kind of shaping me who I am today. Um, especially in a sport like swimming, your, you know, career is made or break on a hundredth of a second. And so you're kind of always like chasing this thing. That's a little bit on the edge that you, you could make it, but you could not, you could qualify, but you could not. And, you know, at the moment when you might not make the Olympic team, such as in my case, um, it feels like, you know, 10 years of hard work is kind of out the door. But now fast forward 10 years, what I've realized is that the foundation, the grit, the learnings, the network, the friends, it's all led me to who I am today. And so it's kind of this, you know, not immediate success story, but it's, it's a beautiful outcome because without those lessons, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Can you tell me how long you stayed in um, when you didn't make the Olympic team? How long did you stay in that disappointment? You know, was it something that stayed with you for a while or, or were you able to, you know, quickly turn it around? Um, that's a really, no one's ever asked me that. Um, I, it's, it's just weird. Like, I don't remember dwelling in it for too long. I was just like, whoa, this is a really interesting feeling because I was also really happy for all my teammates who had made the team who mm -hmm. had kind of done the same amount of work I had done to make that team. But I think what's also very weird is that then you, you know, you take three weeks off and then you're training for four years from now. So you're not even mm -hmm. ever dwelling is you're kind of just like, nope, didn't make it. Now I'm looking ahead to the next four years and what's my plan to try to do it again. Tell me about the, um, I read that you, you talk about how the environment for competitive athletes, especially in college, um, it's so two-sided because you're, you're doing something that absolutely brings you joy and you're good at, but it can also be toxic. Yeah. Just that high level pressure and intensity. How did you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a weird world to be in, especially when you're in it, because you're so hyper focused on getting the goal done and the job done that you don't really realize kind of some of the abuse and the pressure that you're putting on yourself, external forces are putting on you. Um, and I think looking back it, and while in the time it really made me a look, reflect on myself, like, what do I want to do? Who do I want to be? And is this the right environment? And then two is I had to lean on my teammates to get through kind of some of the hardships. And now these women are my best friends. We're, you know, we're not swimming and going to practice twice a day together, but that self-reflection, it kind of forced me to do it. I think a lot at a, a lot earlier of an age than I think I would have without it. So I, I look at it as a positive. Yeah. You know, one of the um, other a big challenge I think that you faced was at 21, you developed pneumonia yeah. and gosh, you were sick for a year, which that is so very hard when something lingers for a very long time. It can make you yeah. depressed. Yeah. Um, and that's really ultimately what ended your career. Tell me about that time. Yeah. So it was an Olympic year. So I had not made the team, swam for another four years. And then that summer I had gotten pneumonia, which eventually turned into mono. Um, and that was obviously kind of, oh, wow. Like you, you couldn't do anything. Um, so I remember sitting there and saying, you know, I'm a pretty active person. Um, I like to have my hands in a bunch of different things. And I had this like kind of 
woke up one night and I had this feeling, I was like, I need to build a website. So I started to, I was like, I need to share my story. I need to kind of just keep myself busy because I, I'm just sitting around all day. And so from that morning on, I started to learn how to code. I started researching blogs. It was, it was kind of like the OG blogger days where there was no Instagram yet. There was no social media, but these blogs and these websites were starting to emerge. So I built my first website and it was all about um, how to style athletic gear to, to work. So it was called Push-Ups with Polish. And so that was the start of my life, I think, as truly in the digital space as a marketer, testing, learning, building audiences, engaging, engaging audiences. And that one experience, because I didn't sit back and let myself dwell in the fact that I had pneumonia and mono and all of this, and I couldn't try out for the team. It made me, you know, a whole other community. And it, it's eventually how I got my first job as well um, as an editor at Pop Sugar. Right. You know, you're so funny. You very nonchalantly said, I taught myself how to code. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. It's a whole different language. That code's so irrelevant now, so I don't know how to code. Let me clarify. <laughs> but it was like, you know, 10, 12 years ago, it was, I got myself pretty far. Right. I mean, because building websites today, there's so many different um, places you can go for help. And, and yeah, Wix yeah. and all that. Yeah. So um, yeah, very impressive that you decided to do that. I think it's a really good lesson in, you know, wherever you are sitting and perhaps it's not where you want to be there's another opportunity right around the corner. Yeah. And I, I always tell, especially kind of the next generation who's trying to get into their professional career. I'm like, even if I didn't build this site to become famous, I didn't really know what blogging was and all of that. And I don't think I became famous with this, but it, it's, it taught me so much about analytics, coding, writing, audience feedback that I was able to take that into what opened the doors professionally in my first job, then in social media, then kind of as a marketer and so on and so forth. So I always say it's like, just build, practice, break things. That's the beautiful part, I think, about a lot of the tools and resources that this like new digital era offers us. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, just before COVID, I believe, is when you had your, your own company and you know, trying to pull it all together with all the moving parts around branding and marketing and finance and all of that. That's really what led you to start Brief. Um, tell that story, how, you know, what, what that greatest challenge was then that led you to do this. Yeah. So post swimming, post my blog, I essentially became a marketer and um, was doing that at various startups, working alongside founders at some larger corporates. And I still had this urge, the same urge that I had when I was five years old to start something. So I kind of went back and I was like, I, I like swimming. I like building websites. I like photography. I like all of this stuff. And um, I started a company called O Club, which was um, sustainable swimwear essentials. That was a great journey. We were in Bloomingdale's Goop, had a lot of press coverage, but I ultimately had to shut it down. And it was right before COVID. And the reason being is I couldn't keep up with all the social media channels, all the paid channels, all the production, everything that needed to basically sustain a modern day business. And so I ended up shutting it down. Again, another beautiful story. I was so upset at the time. It was my baby. But then COVID hit and, you know, the whole world paused and retail kind of had to re-evolve. So it ended up working. But that really set the foundation of, okay, there has to be an easier way for businesses, both large and small, to find the right talent at their price point, to do that fast and affordably. And that's really where Brief came in. And we've created, you know, the largest network of boutique agencies globally. We have over 7,000 teams on our platform and all the tools needed to work with those partners, plan projects, plan your marketing roadmap and ultimately also pay them. So um, again, all learnings opened up this new door, which is brief. And we've been going at it for almost three years and it's been amazing. You know, it, first of all, it, it's very scary. It takes a lot of courage to start a business and you've done it a couple of times now and, and you're still 
at the very beginning of yeah. your life. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the toughest is, is the fundraising in the beginning. So you have an idea and you don't necessarily have the budget to hire all the people that you need. Yeah. What, you know, what has worked for you with as, you know, as far as um, investors and, and how you get people to buy into an idea? Yeah, that's a great question. I think at the, the first words of wisdom I could ever give is run your own race. I think, you know, it's, it, it's a unique world we're living in. There's venture capital, there's, there's fun, there's crowdfunding, there's a bunch of different things that you can do. And I think it's run your own race and it comes back to building a good business. So, you know, the first year and a half of brief, we actually bootstrapped it ourselves and grew really, really, really almost painfully slow because we wanted to know what was working. We wanted to know what wasn't working. We wanted to know our mission. We wanted to know our big picture before taking on outside capital, um, going out into that process, growing the team. Um, so I ultimately say like, keep your eye on the prize, grow your own business and kind of run your own race. And you'll know when you're ready to take it to the next level, you know, when you're ready to bring outside partners on and consider those partners part of your family because they're coming into your business. So highly vet them and interview them just as much as they're interviewing you. Right. By the way, I should mention you have a, a partner. You do, you, you know, have a co-founder. How did you, is George, am I right? Yeah. So George is actually my husband. So oh, I'm one of those crazy ones who um, started a company with my husband, um, but we actually started it when we were dating. Um, wow. Two entrepreneurs came together on a blind date. And then a couple months later, I was talking about my problems as a marketer outsourcing. I was like, I can't find the right partners. It, this is painful. It's taking me months. And then he had previously built a business and he said, you know, I, it's the same thing. I couldn't find the partners to help us with paid social or branding or you name it. And so his background in marketplaces, my background in marketing kind of came together. And that's how we how we started Brief. And um, it was scary kind of like starting a company with your boyfriend at the time. But <laughs> very scary. A lot could we, go wrong. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, but we've done it and we got married and here we are. Um, wow. But it works. I would say it's not for everyone. Like it's it's definitely not for everyone, but it works because two things, we run completely separate sides of, of the business. So there are things that he does really well that I couldn't and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I always say this about if you're starting a business with your partner or a friend or a colleague is the trust level is, is the rock of it all. And we are building not only to create something bigger than ourselves, but we're building for our family's future. And so the trust there is, I think, what makes us tighter than ever. And when things kind of are not running smoothly, we know where we want to go. Um, and so that's kind of the advice I give for if you're looking for a co-founder is like you have to start with the trust first. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think that's really, really critical. Um, we're going to go into our first break. When we come back, we're going to really talk more about the company, what it is. People might not really understand yeah. marketing is such a broad concept. Uh, stay with us for our watch team if you're listening on 1210, and I'll be right back with Emily Bibb. Whether you're just getting started, already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true. Whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Action News at 11 with Rick Williams. It's the team you trust to bring it all together. The stories that impact your community, a sports roundup for the locals, and the AccuWeather forecast you depend on. Action News at 11 with Rick Williams. All right, did you know I was the Mommy Slam Dunk champion? Really? <laughs> yes, really don't sound so surprised. Let's see it. Oh, you're ready. All right, here we go. Let's hear the crowd. <sighs> so go to right, I go to left, fake a mom. Mama, go. Oh, mama! <laughs> She did it. Again. You can't avoid gravity, but United Healthcare can help you avoid financial surprises by helping you compare costs and doctor quality ratings. 
United Healthcare. Uh huh. The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Go for the midnight cares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on action. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. And welcome back. This week, I'm joined by Emily Bibb. And Emily is the co-founder of a company called Brief, which I want to give you an opportunity to kind of in a one line or tell the viewers what exactly it is. I know that it's an online marketplace for agencies, but yeah. you could probably describe it better. Yeah. So we are the world's first agency platform. We've built a community of over 7,000 boutique digital and creative agencies and we connect them with brands and businesses around the world. So everyone from the next stealth startup who's looking to work with a branding agency down to Spotify who use Brief to find a video team to help launch their um, latest campaign um, and everything in between. And it really started myself as a marketer. I know Sue, you were a marketer as well. the world is changing and there's so much to keep up in everything from your social media strategy to your website, to your content and um, finding the right partners was extremely, extremely challenging. And that's what we are solving. What do you think is when, when you talk about the challenge, when you met your husband on that blind date and you were talking about it, what is there's, there are so many agencies, um, but finding the right fit, I would say within the budget as well, because yeah. it can be incredibly, incredibly expensive. Um, yeah. What was that one thing that was just so tough in, in not connecting the brands with the right marketing agency? I think there was no place to start. So, you know, if you think about it, kind of the agency industry and world was really that mad men type of connotation and vibe. Um, You know, you could be the Nikes of the world and work with these big agencies, but everyone else had no other solution. And if they did, there was no place to find them. Um, And things are specific. Every brand is different. So even searching Google or Instagram or you name it to find these partners was extremely cumbersome. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, on average, we asked our community, it would take a marketer up to four months to find an agency partner which is yeah. a long time when they, when you have goals to meet and yes. um, audiences to grow. And so yeah. with our platform, we've completely flipped it. We've brought this industry online and um, a user can come to our site and find the right partner in less than seven days. So um, I wanted to share some numbers. First of all, it's been a very short period of time, less than three years. Yeah. You have 7,000 agencies using yes. Brief. You're in 20 countries maybe yep. more now, um, in under three years. Um, I, that tells me that there was really a need, a very specific need for what you created. Did it? So when you launched, did you just get an influx of, of clients? So when we launched, everyone thought we were crazy. Um, I remember telling, trying to explain to my parents what we're doing. And I was like, remote work is going to be this thing. And you're just going to be able to work with all these partners and You don't all have to be sitting at the same board table. Um, And so we, again, like I said, we took our time. We built, we failed, we built again. The kind of turning point in our business um, was at a bittersweet time for us. And it was during COVID. And it was kind of, oh my gosh, everyone, literally everyone had to rethink the way that they were working. And suddenly, you know, everyone was dispersed. Everyone was remote. And the concept of having these partners who didn't have to be in the same room as you and who could be global and who could support shoots while no one else was back in the office 
was really when the aha moment started to pick up. And then I think as things evolve, the great resignation, um, challenges in hiring, I think it's opened a company's org chart to possibilities of you don't have to hire someone full time. You can actually outsource to these various partners who are really, really good at what they do and build your business that way. So that was kind of the story. Um, I think, you know, it just happened, but some of these trends in the market really is what what's propelled us. It's um, it's fascinating to me how quickly and overnight everything changed globally in business. Yeah. And yeah. when you mentioned you mentioned the great resignation and hiring and boy, that, you know, there's a generation that the process of interviewing and hiring is completely different from when I was growing yeah. up. Yeah. That's is that right. has it been challenging for you? Tell me about the when someone comes in to interview to work with you, because I know you're expanding. Do you find it to be an easy process or are there some problems there because of the change in attitude? It's it's a twofold, but I think it's overall positive. I I always say the, the best thing that came out of this is now I can work with people throughout, like across the country and actually globally. So we we actually just onboarded our first Canadian hire this week and we have a few hires in Australia as well. And that would have never been the case if we were just a New York based company. Right. Um, so all of a sudden I can recruit talent from almost anywhere in the world. Um, and I think I would say we've grown up remote. So it's not like we were a 10 year old business kind of having to rethink our structures. Just as we've grown, we've adopted, you know, certain tools and workplace cultures that um, has really allowed us to do this. But at the same time, we, you know, we do miss being in office and we do have a New York office and a kind of hybrid remote. Um, but overall, it's been really, really positive and productive. It's going to be interesting to see where things are in 10 years. I mean, I think there's such an advantage to be able to avoiding the um, commute the stress of yeah. the travel to and from a place, I think people don't miss that at all. No, I, I don't miss it personally. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's. I think the, the concept of even just doing things on your own time and having that flexibility to be like, hey, I need to, I mean, I think it's amazing for for working mothers. Like the, the fact mm -hmm. that you could like have more time at home and fathers have more time at home and kind of shape your own schedule. I think there's been a lot of, Po overall positive things that have, that have come out of this. Can you talk, Emily, about, you know, entrepreneurs, I think, have so much to worry about because you're not doing a job, a task, going home and forgetting about it. Is yeah. there, um, when you think about your journey and your life, and is there a, a personal challenge that you have had to deal with all through this time that you still do or that you've overcome and you're proud of? I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a constant evolution and I think it's a constant kind of growing pains. Um, I think the, the weirdest thing about being an entrepreneur is the idea of constantly replacing yourself. So you, you come up with this idea, this idea becomes your baby and you're growing and you're growing, but in order to grow, you have to bring on and trust other people to take your vision and execute it. Yeah. And it's a really weird concept because I, I started as a marketer, but I don't think I really do marketing. I mean, maybe, you know, 10% of my day, but I'm doing so many other different pieces that I ha I've had to teach myself how to be HR essentially. Um, or manage I, people, right? Ma manage others. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, you don't go to school and like learn all of this. So I think it's yeah. that the constant evolution of being open to pushing yourself, um, looking at your flaws, having to pivot, and then kind of jumping into the next thing. I want to talk a little bit about the culture and your team and your people and how, you know, what your philosophy is for keeping them motivated and engaged. And something I read about, you have a, um, I don't know what I would call it, five one-year jobs oh, is yeah. kind of a mindset that you have. Talk about that and how, you know, that helps your employees basically stay motivated. Yeah. I mean, so it kind of goes back to that idea of I'm, I am obsessed with evolution, like constantly evolving, constantly growing as a person. 
Um, and as a founder, I feel like every year I have a different job and a different thing that I have to push myself towards in growth. And I think the same thing should apply to your employees. So this concept that you can come to brief and start in one thing and master it, but ideally you're evolving into taking those skill sets and maybe um, putting them into product or maybe putting them into management or maybe saying, hey, I'm really good at customer service. Let me jump into sales. And it's this partnership in a way of if I'm evolving and you're evolving and the business is growing, then we're doing something right. And if we're not, then we probably have to reevaluate and see, okay, is the business not, is the business not growing? Are you not growing as a person? And what, what can we do to fix that? Do you think that's, as I'm listening to you say that, do you think that that is a female um, mindset? I, you know, I think by nature, women are always wanting to evolve and grow and learn and we care about the community. We're looking around and making sure everybody's okay. Um, And men, you know, and this is a generalization. They're focusing on the task at hand. You know, when you see, and you know, your husband's your partner. So how do you see the difference between what your women employees bring to work and what the men do and how they work good together? That's an interesting question. I, I don't know. I feel I feel like we're both like, I feel like everyone's pretty much open to it. I think it's just how you position it. So I, you know, and I think it's also a a generation thing and just depending on your past. So, you know, I've been in startups from essentially my entire life. I'm kind of used to that. Okay. Every quarter, it's going to be different. Every day I kind of have to buckle up for something unexpected um, where maybe a colleague who might've come from a traditional more, let's say finance background. It's something that we have to train and nurture a little bit more of like this openness can actually make you the best person of yourself. It's not always going to be fun, but looking Mm -hmm. back in a year's time, you'll have a lot more ownership, a lot more experiences and learnings under your belt. So I think it's, I, I, I don't know. I think we're all in it together. Sportsmanship is a big kind of foundation of our culture and just being like, we're all going to hold each other up. We're all going to fail together. And we're all going to like run and grow this thing as fast as we can. Tell me what happens if, so when you're bringing together agencies and brands, yeah. what happens if they get together and it doesn't work? What, you know, had, what are the repercussions of that? Yeah. I, it's, it's not as common as, as you would expect um, because we've built for that process. So similar to hiring a candidate or, um, I don't know, working with a colleague, kind of just life in general, um, we built in a a really robust kind of matchmaking and interview process. So every brand has to speak with at least two agencies because there's a point of comparison, similar to hiring. You Mm -hmm. would never just hire the first candidate you talk to, you'd kind of interview around. Um, And then we've, you know, through the platform, really adjusted the expectation settings of the project of the budgets, all of that. So it's pretty clear when a brand and agency decide to work together and kick off, they've met each other, expectations are on the table, everything's kind of there. So there's nothing hidden versus the old way of doing things. So it's pretty, it's pretty rare, but if it, if it goes poorly, we do our best to kind of find them the next right, right, best partner for them. And here's an interesting question. How do you market brief? Yeah. Um, so from the very like onset of, of when we were building this thing, I, I made it apparent. I was like, if I'm going to work with the best marketers in the world and the best agencies and creative in the world, I'm going to have to talk the talk and walk the walk. And I could, because I was, that's, I've been scary. In- <laughs> that's a little, that's a lot of pressure. No, no, no. But I, but I was like, okay, I'm going to build a brand that they can relate to. So I don't want it to look like this normal tech brand. I don't want it to feel like that. I want it to feel like a product. And I always say a product that they would have open with their other tabs. So they might have their sweet green order up in one tab, their rent the runway kind of basket and then brief. I wanted it to feel a part of their day to day. And so that's what I started. That's that's so smart. (laughs) And, and that's, that's what I started with. And then, um, like I said, it, 
and you know this, you have to really understand who you're talking to, to be able mm -hmm. to essentially sell to them or kind of get the attention from them. So I, I really took my time in understanding our user, the, their behaviors, all of that. And now we grow through um, digital marketing, partnerships, referrals, word of mouth, you name it. Yeah, I, I think it's, and you're probably already there at some point, people, do, when they're working on a project and they need an agency, they're thinking of brief, you know, it's, it's so cool. It's so like, I haven't even, sometimes I don't sit back and I'm like, whoa, like how did, how did these brands find us and they're using us and they love us? Um, it's really, it's really cool. And how, where did the name come from? I know, but tell our viewers. Yeah. So, um, Truthfully, brief was like an idea that kind of woke, again woke me up, and I even have the note that I like wrote it down. I'm like, we're going to be called brief, um, but brief is a play on words um, on you know the whole briefing process of an agency or like mm -hmm. the RFP process. So it's a play on words, um, and then spelt differently because I really wanted a name that we could build a brand behind. Um, that was really important to me. Yeah. Um Tell me what you're doing. You have your own company and your partner's your husband. Do you have to be very intentional about taking time to not think about brief? And what are you doing when you're not yes. working? Uh, yes. When we're not working, well, we currently were just renovating a house. So that was like our oh. other um that's a major that project in New York. Oh my gosh. It's, I always say house renovations are harder than any other business oh I've my ever God. started in my life. Yeah. Um, but we, we are very, very, very intentional on kind of checking off, making sure, you know, like Saturday is like a no computer email day. Um, and because we live in beautiful Colorado, um, going on hikes and just spending time to recharge before we mm -hmm. dive back into the madness. Yeah. Nature is, I always say it's, it's really medicine and it's, and people yeah. have, you know, woken up to the outdoors again, because of COVID, I think, yeah. you know, we were forced to be inside. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and one thing I've really, I think gotten a lot better at, and I think this could apply to anyone, founders, non-founders, parents, you name it, is I realized I was like, I'm not, I'm not in a, a sprint. Like, what I want to do as a marathon, I want to be doing this business for the rest of my life. I want to be building and helping and evolving for the rest of my life. And when I kind of realized that I was like, there's no need to work seven days a week. You have to take care of yourself. You have to step back because you will burn out and it won't be possible mm -hmm. to do everything that you want to do. That's been kind of like my 2022 theme. Um, and it's really Things still run when you're not online, so it's okay. Um, yeah, that's I, I think that's so wise, and I'm, you know, I'm always impressed when younger women learn the value and the power of slowing down early on, because um, I just think as a society, everybody's running, 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 yeah. and at the end of the day, what what's the hurry, right? Exactly, exactly. Where are you going? Um, so exactly. the fact that you yeah, I just think that's so important. Slowing down. I, I say that to my kids all the time. Just slow down in everything that you do. Yeah. Your speech, your work, your movements. Um, that's when actually that don't you think that's when ideas come to you? It's one of the best. That's why the shower ideas come to everyone, because you're not doing like you're showering. Right. You're not distracted. <laughs> <laughs> the water, the calmness of the water. Yes, that's yeah. so true. That's so, so yeah, true. taking time to just let everything settle before you dive back in um, for everything, personal life, work life, all of that has been, has been crucial. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so appreciative of your coming and um, sharing your story with our viewers. And I know that some young women who are perhaps thinking, you know, they have an idea, they'll be inspired. Um, and I wish you continued success. I'm, I'm excited to see how far brief goes. Thank you. And I'm so impressed with the community you have built as well. And this has been so awesome. And thank you for your questions and your research and just having me on the show. You're very welcome. We're going to go into another break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Marcy Shankweller again. Sherry Morrison, our Lifestyle Watch contributor, will be talking to Marcy. We'll be right back. Whether you're just getting started 
already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams dreams really can 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 come true. Whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Action News at 11 with Rick Williams. It's the team you trust to bring it all together. The stories that impact your community, a sports roundup for the locals, and the AccuWeather forecast you depend on. Action News at 11 with Rick Williams. All right, did you know I was the Mommy Slam Dunk champion? Really? <laughs> yes, really don't sound so surprised. Let's see it. Oh, you're ready. All right, here we go. Let's hear the crowd. So go to right, go to left, fake a mom. Mama, go. Oh, mama! She did it. Again. You can't avoid gravity, but United Healthcare can help you avoid financial surprises by helping you compare costs and doctor quality ratings. United Healthcare. Uh huh. The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resorts. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on action. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello and welcome to the Lifestyle segment of Women to Watch. I'm Sherry Morrison. Today we are speaking with Marcy Shankweiler, CEO of For Pete's Sake Cancer Respite Foundation. Welcome to the show, Marcy. Thank you for having me, Sherry. My pleasure. So this week we are focused on a lifestyle for all ages while dealing with a cancer diagnosis, helping patients, caregivers, and families, and I quote, recognize it is love, not cancer, that defines them. Marcy, you started for Pete's sake 22 years ago. Can you give us a little history? Sure. So uh, my first husband was Pete, uh, and he was diagnosed with a form of testicular cancer back in 1998. And during our journey with cancer, we recognized that um, there were so many different aspects of our life that were was that were out of control, that Our friends didn't know what to do to support us. Our family was at a loss of words. We were so young. And there were not many resources that were directed towards young adults at that time. So we we chose to uh, embark on our own respite during his journey with cancer. Um, He passed away um, a short time thereafter. And collectively, we realized what that respite meant for us. So... um, after his um, passing, I really launched into For Pete's Sake, which was really his idea. Um, and here we are 22 years later with uh, having helped thousands of people. Well, um, I think uh, after talking with you, and I, and I think there's a message that you and had expressed you really want people to realize, and that's that respite and taking a break from cancer plays a huge role for cancer patients not just their cancer patients, but their caregivers and their families collectively healing their lives together. Yes, like, you know, cancer affects the entire family, not just the person that's diagnosed, but everyone that surrounds them, everyone that loves them. And that, you know, the family unit has has to build a certain resilience and has to build a team mentality uh, and has to ensure that they can, you know, collaborate and communicate well to be able to navigate the cancer journey together. So for Pete's sake, steps in and helps in all that. Um, And, you know, it's good to be able to, you know, take a respite really to reconnect, refresh and rejuvenate collectively as a family unit. Sure. I understand Uh, my mother died in 2005 of pancreatic cancer. um, And she was a really healthy 71 year old until this this hit her. 
um, towards the end, for some reason, uh, I organized for her to come up to my home with um, other family members, and we spent three full days together. Um, and, you know, we just went out to restaurants and on the Delaware River, and we danced, and we listened to music, and she drank her first margaritas, which I was shocked. <laughs> I had a margarita before, <laughs> and I and I was instructed not to tell her sister. <laughs> oh, not um, yeah. But anyway, I looking back, I posted a photo from those three days, and um, I wrote then that I witnessed a strength in my mother that I never ever knew existed, and um, I'm so grateful for those three days. Uh, I get it. Families need to have this opportunity. Um, when for Pete's sake started, how did your respite experiences begin? Are they they're different than they are now? I I believe. Right. So when we first started, we we used donated homes um, throughout the Philadelphia region, um, and then it became kind of expanded into the Greater Delaware Valley and then tri-state region. And then as time went by, we purchased homes in Florida. Um, we had some travel partners, Apple Vacations, Cheap Caribbean, um, and other resorts. And that was really how we built the program. Um, and we were doing respites in that way. Um, we also did a, a respite that was uh, 10 families at one time in Maine. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a math major. I was a math major and a tax accountant. So, you know, I, I've been collecting data about outcomes of respite since 2005. And we did a blind study from 2014 to 18. So we have a lot of data and we were looking at all our data and we realized, um, you know, what respite experience is most beneficial for every age of the person in the family because nearly 50 percent of the people we help are children at risk of losing a parent so you know a lot of teenagers a lot of younger children um, that accompany their parents on this respite so um, we've evolved since then um, and as you know covid really was part of that um, when we could no longer travel anymore um, we actually started sending people to a very local destination which is woodlock resorts up in Holly, PA. Um, and we were sending 10 families at one time. And there is a, um, some significant uh, data related to collectively experiencing respite, you know, in, within your own family unit, but also with people who are similarly situated, who are going through the same experience. Yeah. Um, you're very fortunate that the, the lodge at Woodlock is, is so convenient. Um, it, it is one of the um, most prestigious and fabulous resorts, I think, in the country. Um, and obviously, through all of this data that you've collected, you are quite the businesswoman. So I, I think that probably starting for Pete's sake was not what you went to college for. <laughs> no. <laughs> you have a degree and you had a real job and and then all of a sudden, this must have happened. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's about people, passion and purpose. Right. Like and, and you know, we bring people together, um, you know, having lived it, I'm passionate about, you know, making life better for cancer patients and their families. You know, it's such an isolating time, especially when you're so young. And and then, you know, on top of it, losing Pete, you know, really, um, it takes a lot of work to overcome you know, such devastating grief. And, you know, we see families who are survivors and we see families who have to experience what I had to experience, you know, and so collectively, you know, the, the, the purpose is really starting a community that really, you know, helps people realize that love is greater than, you know, cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the um, families that you have together, um, you, you ha they have an experience together and help each other, I'm sure. And is that something that's optional? Do you have events for them to participate together or do they kind of choose and select what they do with these other people? Right. So we have um, respites are six days long. So that's really something that we like because we like the longevity of it. And, you know, when you get diagnosed with cancer, you've lost all control. So what we like to do is when they come to Woodlock for those five nights, that they actually have some control of what they choose to do and whom they do it with. Um, so what we found is that the, all the families eat meals together um, on their own. So they're all in the same dining room, but they have their family unit actually sharing a meal. And, you know, we get a lot of feedback. Just mealtime has, you know, ha has become a 
something of the past in our society. Um, during COVID, you found people gathering more like that. Um, but sharing a meal is so important. Um, and then we also offer activities where families get to do things together. So we have, you know, some mindfulness, some meditation, some creative art therapy that we do collectively where families get to choose to participate if they'd like to. Um, you know, and I think a lot of those, are, those relationships happen very organically where families really begin to talk, children begin to relate to one another. And then you have, you know, this support system that organically was created from this respite experience um, that really strengthens the own, the, you know, that, that, that own family's health. So, so what do you think the significance of respite is? I mean, when you go through your checklist and all of the data that you gather, what is, what is the significance of all of no, I, th I think I've, I've really kind of narrowed it down to like overall family health, right? So having a team mentality, being able to have uh, connectedness, being able to communicate effectively, and then building resilience, right? Because a lot of people go on respite and then they return to their treatment protocols, you know, they return to what's happening to them, you know, at that moment in their cancer journey. So you need some resilience. And then, you know, coupled with that is really just you, your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, you know, eating healthy, having meals, being one with nature, you know, being very intentional about what you do together. Um, and then spiritual health. And then since we, you know, since we don't have any, um, there's no cost to participate in our program for the family. Is there's a financial health too that we're trying to promote? So, so collectively, you know, we are a, a health organization that really, you know, wants to make respite a continuum of care for families facing cancer. And you have other support for families who cannot actually take a, a respite trip. Um, you have emotional support, respite at home, and you have a magical family moments. I know. Um, so in 22 years, how many, how many patients and families do you think you've really touched? Oh, we, well, we're actually approaching our 10,000th person. Wow. Sometime this, probably, probably sometime in the next 30 days. So we have a little countdown board in our office. Oh, so that's, that's incredible. Really, really significant moment for us. Well, congratulations. Thank so you. So what's next? What's next? So, you, you know, um, like I said before, like we're, we're, we're set out to here to change patient care for families. Um, so we uh, are exploring doing something that would do so um, in actually constructing the nation's first respite center um, up at Woodlock. And this would drastically open our program um, to many more families that really need to find you know, reconnection and be able to refresh and rejuvenate together. So it's a monumental project. Um, you know, living your dream is important, right? This was Pete's dream from the very beginning. And here we are 22 years later, circling back, um, you know, but, uh, but when you see that the impact we have and the lives we improve, you know, this is the road that we want to take collectively as an organization. Well, that's fantastic, Marcy. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank well, you. Uh, our time is up, unfortunately. Thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing your story, your mission and your message. Uh, for more information about Marcy and for Pete's sake, Cancer Respite Foundation, go to www.takeabreakfromcancer.org. And don't forget to check out the lodge at Woodlock in Hawley, Pennsylvania. It is magnificent. Thank you again, Marcy. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you, Sue, for having me. I look forward to next week when we're joined by Laura Kiefer of Handwork Studio. Sue will be right back to close out the show. Ladies, keep living your dream. Thank you. Whether you're just getting started, already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true, whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Action News at 11 with Rick Williams. It's the team you trust to bring it all together. The stories that impact your community, a sports roundup for the locals, and the AccuWeather forecast you depend on. Action News at 11 with Rick Williams. All right, did you know I was the Mommy Slam Dunk Champion? Really? <laughs> yes, really don't sound so surprised. Let's see it. Oh, you're ready. All right, here we go. Let's hear the crowd. <sighs> so go to right, go to look. Fake a mom. Mama, go. Oh, mama. 
She did it. Again? You can't avoid gravity, but United Healthcare can help you avoid financial surprises by helping you compare costs and doctor quality ratings. United Healthcare. Uh huh. The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on action. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome back, everyone. Um, Thanks so much again for joining me for another week of Women to Watch. I want to say thank you to Emily Bibb for sharing her story, Um, for Marcy Shankweller for being a part of our Lifestyle Watch segment as well. And I also want to thank Tone, my producer, who I should have been thanking for weeks now, who does such a great job. Uh, Next week, I'm going to be joined by Christine O'Leary. Christine is U.S. Board Trustee of the Hemochromatosis um, International Organization. So I hope you'll be with us. Have a great week, everyone, and stay well. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on action. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today.